So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it. Hey guys, so before we get into today's video, I wanna give a shout out to my boys on YouTube known as the Midnight Mormons. As you may know, I am a friend of the Midnight Mormons show and with good reason. Cardin. Ooh, good thing women don't have the priesthood in our faith because you would be a handful <laughs> in the quorum of the 12. Oh! 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 Brad. Obedience is the first principle of heaven and Gen Z and millennials have not been taught obedience well. And Kwaku. You will not win, do you understand me? <laughs> you will not win, you scum! <laughs> I will eat you! I'll eat my neighbors. Are some of the funniest and most down-to-earth faithful saints online today. The show approaches Latter-day Saint culture, doctrine, and current events in ways that break the stuffy boomer mold. Check them out and subscribe. You won't regret it. So one of the unique features of the restored gospel is its rejection of divine command theory. This is the idea that God determines what is right and wrong. It's the idea that an immoral act, such as animal abuse, could be made moral if God commanded it, because God's nature is ultimately the source and standard of all moral judgments. On the other hand, the restored gospel teaches that even God himself is subject to eternal law, and it is his conformity to the celestial order of being that makes him God. And we are invited to enter into that celestial order of being and join him in that order of being in what we call Godhood. In what follows, I'm going to explore the nature of morality from the ground up in a way that not only makes sense of morality and the moral language that everyone uses, but also takes you into a model of morality that is consistent with the truths of the restored gospel. So far as I can tell, to start a conversation about morality, we actually have to start even deeper. We actually need to start by discussing the nature of being itself. Probably the most basic and universally accepted fact is that we exist. I don't believe any fact could qualify as more basic or self-evident than that. Being is real, but it actually goes deeper than that. For conscious creatures like ourselves, being seems to exist at all times in a tension between two poles, suffering and its opposite, which for our purposes here we'll call well-being. The reality is that in every action, you and everyone around you is flapping their wings against the constant gravitational-like pull of suffering and trying to fly higher and higher into the skies of well-being. In fact, it would seem that literally all sane human action is always, either consciously or subconsciously, some move they are making to try and pull themselves away from suffering and towards some conception of increased well-being. Just think about it. Why did you eat lunch today? Because if you didn't, you would suffer. Why did you watch Netflix last night? To avoid the suffering of boredom. Why did you help that family down the street? because your conscience would grind on you if you failed to live up to your expectations of yourself. Or perhaps you know deep down that building relationships with others will eventually benefit you. Keep trying to find an example of when you did something that can not ultimately be attributed to your quest for increased personal well-being. I have yet to find one. Some of the greatest philosophers in history have understood this. All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even those who hang themselves. Happiness, therefore, being found to be something final and self-sufficient, is the end at which all actions aim. Some may try to point to examples of a person sacrificing their immediate well-being for the well-being of others to refute this. 
However, if you reflect on that, you will quickly realize that no one ever chooses suffering for suffering's sake. They sacrifice because they believe that doing so will ultimately bring them more well-being, even if it is immediately bringing them some level of suffering. A mother will choose to lay down her life or her comforts for her children because her well-being is ultimately increased by seeing her children well. And she would rather die than live with herself in a world where she chose her own life and comfort over theirs. If any action meets the definition of insanity, it's to choose suffering with no expectation that suffering will lead to greater well-being in the future. Sacrifice makes sense because implicit in the word sacrifice is the idea that we sacrifice something now for something better in the future, even if that future is in an afterlife. The reality of being as a struggle against what we might call the gravitational force of suffering that's constantly pulling on us provides a new paradigm for understanding what moral language is describing. Moral language is not just a description of good and bad. Good and bad are concepts of value. Morality includes value, or the idea of good and bad, but it also includes obligation in relation to the good. Morality does not just say what is good. It says that you are obligated to do what is good and not what is bad. Any moral formulation that doesn't include obligation simply isn't describing morality. It's just describing value. Moral language describes what a person ought or ought not do, what they should or should not do. But what is this notion of the ought or obligation? The ought is a statement about a direction toward an end or goal. Otherwise, the term would lose all meaning. For example, if I want to get to San Diego from Los Angeles, I ought to go south. And if I want to get to San Francisco, I ought to go north. The ought is the word that we use to point to a behavior we must take if we desire a particular outcome. So what if there was an outcome that all sentient, sane creatures shared universally as a matter of objective fact? It seems perfectly reasonable to think that all sane people everywhere desire to move away from their own suffering. If this is the case, then this would make sense of moral language and give it an objective basis. Under the assumption that the person that I'm dealing with is sane and desires their own well-being, I could say that they ought not do things that would cause their suffering, or that they ought to do things that I believe would likely lead them to their well-being. In the end, there are actual right and wrong answers to moral questions because there are right and wrong answers as to what brings about more or less suffering. Now to summarize, every human action is ultimately rooted in a desire to move away from suffering and towards some implicit notion of an ultimate well-being as a matter of objective fact. The ought describes what course a person must take to reach a desired end. The logical conclusion of these premises is that the universal desire of all sane human beings to avoid their own suffering acts as the objective basis for moral statements. But isn't well-being subjective? Well, stick around for the next video and we'll talk more about it.